we're going to start the story at the beginning here in the cell body or the dendrite. So what we're assuming is that there has been another cell that's already stimulated this cell. So what we can assume here is that there has been a release of neurotransmitter from one cell and it has gone across the synapse and is now stimulating this cell. So in this case, this would have been the presynaptic cell and this is the postsynaptic cell. So as we will get to at the end of this story, there has been a release of neurotransmitter and these neurotransmitters then bind, say this is the neurotransmitter here, it is going to bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. That is why these responses are called postsynaptic potentials. In the next slide I'll discuss how the cell body is acting as an integrator to integrate all of the incoming information. Because remember that we could have multiple inputs coming into this one cell okay, with different timing and different locations. From the previous slide what we discussed is that there has been a stimulus from a presynaptic cell which has released a neurotransmitter and has crossed the synapse. It is bound to a receptor on the postsynaptic membrane and this is going to alter a chemically gated channel. So let's just take a look here for example if it was a chemically gated sodium channel. We know that sodium is higher on the outside so sodium would move in and that would result in a depolarization of the cell. If for example potassium was involved and there was a chemically gated potassium channel open we know that potassium is higher on the inside so potassium would move out and it would have hyperpolarized the cell. So if we have a depolarization this is bringing the cell towards threshold and therefore we are going to get an excitatory postsynaptic potential. If for example potassium moves out of the cell we're going to get a hyperpolarization and this would result in inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So whether you get an EPSP or an IPSP depends on the type of chemically gated channel that's being opened in response to a particular neurotransmitter appreciating that this cell here could have released one neurotransmitter and this other cell could have released a different neurotransmitter. Okay, each postsynaptic membrane could have receptors for more than one neurotransmitter. Note that we have said these graded potentials, these EPSPs and IPSPs, are um, experiencing decremental conduction. That means that as they move from their site of stimulation towards the axon hillock, their amplitude is going to decrease. So although it may be a very large EPSP, by the time it reaches the axon hillock, it would have decreased in amplitude. Similarly, here we have an IPSP decreasing in amplitude and another EPSP, assuming here that there would have been three points of stimulation. So that's one of the main points about graded potentials is this decremental conduction. The fact that these cell bodies are saying to be um, integration sites right here, um, the G is missing, integration, is the fact that we have summation of these responses. And this is just like math. So if we have a EPSP and we add it to an IPSP, depending on the amplitude of these, if this was 5 millivolts and this was 5 millivolts, we're going to end up with zero. So all of this, the postsynaptic responses are added up together and then at the axon hillock there's either going to be a super threshold or a subthreshold stimulus. If it is above threshold, as we can see here, we are going to elicit an action potential. If it was below threshold, we would not get an action potential. I just want to talk about summation again for one minute. If you stimulate a cell and it is a graded response, if you stimulate it again before it's returned to the resting membrane potential, it will actually start to add up. Now this would be exactly the same thing if you had an IPSP and then you stimulated it again and it was another IPSP. So the amplitude would increase depending on the frequency of the stimulation. This is known as temporal summation. So taking a look here at our diagram, if we were to stimulate this cell very, very quickly, this EPSP in effect would increase its amplitude. Now it's still going to undergo decremental conduction, 
but initially its amplitude would be higher. In addition to temporal summation, we could also have spatial summation, or space. So here we have three neurons stimulating this one cell and at different locations on the cell. So in this case, when you have multiple stimulation, what it's going to do is we're going to add up the net result of all of these. So in this case, it looks like we have two EPSPs and an IPSP, so the end result would be a depolarization. The question, of course, is, is it above threshold or not? Now, you have to realize that both of these are going to be combined together. So say this cell was firing very quickly, which would making this EPSP larger, but this one was very slow. Okay, so we're just getting that EP IPSP, but this one is firing very, very quickly, and so that one would increase. So you have to appreciate that both spatial and temporal summation are occurring in the integration of these graded responses in the cell body. Now let's take a look at what's going on at the axon hillock. Here is where these graded potentials are then going to stimulate the cell to either elicit an action potential or not. Okay? And remembering that these action potentials are all or none. So if it is above threshold, we will get an action potential. If not, there will be no action potential. What happens is the graded responses come in, spatial and temporal summation, so we're adding all of these up. If it is above threshold, what happens is voltage-gated channels, now noting here that the voltage-gated potassium, sorry, voltage-gated sodium channel, okay, right here, the voltage-gated sodium channel is going to open up. As a result, sodium moves into the cell. Remembering that sodium moving into the cell is going to cause a depolarization. Following that, potassium is then going to move out of the cell, okay, right there, and the cell will repolarize and actually hyperpolarize. Now there's a lot more detail about those sodium channels and those potassium channels, the voltage-gated channels. There's the inactivation gate and the activation gate of the sodium channel. Um, that was discussed previously. I'm not going to get into that in this big picture right now. So all we need to know is that the graded potential brings it to threshold. Sodium coming in is the depolarizing or the upstroke of the action potential. Potassium coming or going out is going to be the repolarizing and um, hyperpolarizing phase of the action potential. So what's happened now is that we've generated an action potential at the axon hillock. But this information must travel down the cell towards the axon hillock if it's going to pass this information on to another cell. So we need to propagate, okay, this propagation here, we need to propagate this action potential so that it travels down the action, or sorry, down the axon. Now, note that this is going to be non-decremental conduction, meaning the amplitude of these action potentials is going to remain the same as it travels down the axon. What accounts, how do we account for this propagation, is that when the sodium moves in through these voltage-gated channels, the sodium is then going to diffuse. It's going to diffuse in both directions. And what it's going to do in the cell body is it will cause a depolarization, but there's not enough voltage-gated channels in the cell body to initiate an action potential. Therefore, it's always going to go in one direction, away from the cell body. So the sodium comes in. What's going to happen now is that it's going to locally depolarize the adjacent part of the membrane. And that's why this is called a local current. It will bring the cell to threshold, and we will generate another action potential. Okay, again, same concept here. Sodium comes in, potassium leaves, depolarization, repolarization. The sodium that comes in here is then going to diffuse and generate another action potential. The reason it's not generating an action potential in the retrograde direction or in the direction towards the cell body is because this part of the membrane okay, is now in the refractory period, so it's impossible to generate an action potential in that direction. So this ensures the one-way propagation of action potentials away from the cell body. What I've tried to illustrate here by these little boxes is the myelin sheath. Now remember this is going to be different depending on the PNS or CNS. We either have the allocotendrocytes or we have the Schwann cells. 
But in either case, it forms a myelin sheath. What this does is insulates it, uh, insulates the axon, so that there can be no movement of ions. So ions are not going to go in or they're not going to get out, which means that this sodium that has diffused okay, from the previous action potential okay, can only generate an action potential in the spaces between the myelon, the myelin, sorry, and those are called nodes of Ron VA. Okay, this is because at this location there will be sodium and potassium channels, the voltage gated channels, and we will be able to initiate an action potential. So we end up with this action potential okay, skipping from one node of Ron VA to the next. This is called saltatory conduction. And what it does is it increases the rate of uh, propagation from the cell body down to the end of the cell. Because remember, this is just an information highway. We want this information to get down to the other cell as quickly as possible.